Today we're going to go through part two of our series on uh, First Peter. Uh, remember last time? Last time there was a four-part uh, sermon, and uh, I think that was a bit too much for some. I asked Evan the four parts afterwards, and he couldn't tell me. So today's just a three-part message. So I think it's a bit easier to, to manage. Um, if we recall back to last time, we looked at there was four parts uh, in the beginning of Peter's first letter. Uh, he wrote about being strangers in the world. That's our current situation. We are uh, pilgrims of the dispersion. Or we're strangers in the world. We're, we're here, but we're not really here, are we? we? We know that our eternal home is in heaven. That, that awaits. And we are the, the elect of God. we are chosen and uh, chosen out of the world, uh, set apart for God. And we've been called into a living hope and this hope that awaits us. We don't have it all now uh, because hope is what is still to come. Otherwise, it's not really hope, is it? And I also asked you, well, I asked everyone, how could you describe joy? Uh, last, time I dis- uh, last time I asked you, uh, no one could describe it. Um, who would like to have a go today? Who, who can describe this joy that we feel as Christians? Goodness, yep. <laughs> oh, okay. How would you describe joy? So it's not based on our worldly, daily, temporary existence. It's based on what we know for truth, the truth of Jesus and Jesus' resurrection as well. Yes, yeah, Donna. Yeah, well, welcome back, Donna. <laughs> yep. As opposed to just fleeting happiness, which is based on what happens day by day. Supposed to. Very good. Well, much better than last, last time, thank you. Uh, because I think last time I, uh, I said joy inexpressible and it was indescribable. None of us could describe it. So thank you, Glynis and Donna. Um, and do we always feel this joy? Who, who always feels joyful? Oh, well done, Glynis. <laughs> yes. Do you feel like that all the time? Your feet never touch the ground. Great. Wonderful. And I also drew, drew the correlation between joy and feeling joy and our love for Jesus. So, do you feel joy? I could also ask the question, do you love Jesus? I, I, I draw the correlation there. I'm not sure if you do too. So, the, the other question to ask is, do you love Jesus? Because I think if you can answer that question with a yes, then you can also feel that joy. It may not be all the time, but I, I draw the connection between loving Jesus and knowing joy. So Peter wrote his first letter for the, um, the Christians who were in danger of losing their way. Uh, they were facing many trials and they were facing rejection for being Christians. So the Apostle Peter wrote to them. Uh, he also saw that they were in danger of persecution and they were not prepared for it. So his writing was twofold, to, to encourage them and to testify to the true grace of God. Uh, Peter wrote his letter uh, to us, or to the Christians, as the elect of God. Uh, because we enjoy many blessings. Uh, We are born again to a living hope, and we have this joy inexpressible and full of glory. So today's going to be a three-part message. I'll quiz some of you after. So I don't don't have a handout as like (laughs) Pastor Dave. I'm not not as organized as that. So The three parts for today are ministry, looking at how does ministry look in our lives, the focus of our hope, and the fear of the Lord. And before we go getting scared, it's not, the, not a worldly fear. Fear is a right and reverent fear of our almighty God and creator. He made us, uh, so we rightly live in a good, godly, reverent fear of God. Debbie, can I ask you to come and bring us the reading? Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Debbie. So we're going to look at um, ministry. Um, and we've had an interesting week. <laughs> Uh, with various ones in our church ministering to other people and also being ministered to. I think ministry goes both ways. 
Um, when, when I first came to Collie, I think 12 years ago now, uh, I was looking for a church that held ministry in high regard, so ministry to its own people and to the community at large as well. Um, and that, that, that's why I settled on this church, because I think this church has always held ministry in very high regard. Um, yeah, not being sort of self, self-absorbed and um, shut off from the world, but having an outreach focus, um, having a community-minded a ministry focus as well. So as we continue in verses 10 to 12, we find that Peter expands upon this topic of salvation. Now if we take the time to contemplate what, we re- what Debbie read in this passage, we'll begin to understand just how privileged we are as God's elect. Uh, for we learn that we are recipients of a gospel that was prophesied and has come to us through the efforts of a very distinguished group of people. We're going to look at uh, four groups of individuals who have brought us this gospel. We've been served by the prophets. Um, When the prophets prophesied, they're often intrigued by what they revealed. Imagine Isaiah when he wrote Isaiah 53. How did he fully comprehend what he was writing about? This is because they were inspired or moved by the Holy Spirit and not by their own will. Therefore, they're often perplexed as to what they were writing about, what they were prophesying about. Um, As we live after Christ, we live after the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. It all makes sense to us. So they they were serving us to come. Uh, Again, we we as Christians, we've been served by many great names. Moses and Samuel, David, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Daniel. Uh, These men and many others, they spent their lives and in some cases even gave their own lives in service to us, to you and me. Uh, These great heroes of the faith suffered so much in their service to God and to us who are now in Christ. Does that make you feel special? We've also been served by the Holy Spirit, uh, for it was the Holy Spirit who inspired the prophets to proclaim the things to come. It was the Holy Spirit who inspired David and Isaiah to foretell the sufferings of Christ. It was the Holy Spirit who likewise moved the prophets to proclaim the glories to follow, e.g. the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Uh, It was the Holy Spirit who inspired the apostles to reveal the gospel, as Jesus promised he would in his message to his apostles. Again, if we think about this further, through the Spirit's ministry of inspiration and revelation in the lives of the prophets and apostles, we have been served, that they were not serving themselves, but us to come. Because of his work, we have today the completed revelation of God's word that we can read. And this is in addition to the sanctifying work, the ongoing sanctification by the Holy Spirit. So how how do we respond to that? I hope we don't take it too flippantly. Uh, With joy, with joy. (laughs) Good answer. I think we need to really appreciate the service that the Holy Spirit has rendered us throughout the ages. Um, And is this not an indication of the great value that God has placed upon his people? Again, we we are very special in God's sight. And there's another group of individuals, the the apostles. Um, As we looked at last time in verse 1, we read that uh, those who preached the gospel to you, so this is referring to the, the apostles of Jesus Christ. The apostles who were commissioned to preach the gospel as they carried out the Great Commission. Even they considered themselves but servants for those to whom they preached. They were serving as servants of Christ. So we've been served by the prophets, we've been served by the Holy Spirit, we've been served by the apostles, such men as Peter, James, John and Paul, again men who gave their lives to convince the world that our faith in their testimony is not fleeting or not unfounded, but that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. We we know that. We know it here. We know it here. It's because of their testimony. Again, when we take the time to think about those who spent their lives ministering to us, we can't help but conclude that Christians have a very high place in God's plan of redemption as it has unfolded throughout history. 
So we've been served by the prophets, uh, the Holy Spirit, and the apostles. There's one more in that passage. Did anyone pick it up? Angels. A bit different. But verse, t- verse 12 tells us that angels had a keen interest in the things prophesied by the prophets and in things proclaimed by the apostles through the gospel. Even the angels that they were uttering things that they probably couldn't fully comprehend at the time as well about God's overall plan of salvation. That they too were involved in the process of foretelling and revealing the salvation in Christ. For example, uh, the angel Gabriel's appearances to Daniel uh, and Zacharias and Mary. But like the prophets, angels were also in the dark concerning the full details of the coming salvation. So again, the angels were ministering to us and not themselves. Our Father in heaven must hold his elect, the church, in very high regard to have them served by such this distinguished company. Uh, To be so privileged should motivate us to praise God for his grace and to devote our lives in grateful service to him and his people. But even above all these, the grace that God bestowed towards us reached its peak when in addition to all these, he sent his only son to serve us as well. But just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Knowing this, shall we not respond with grateful service through faithful obedience to his will? So far in Peter's letter, he has summarised some of the blessings that we've enjoyed as God's pilgrims or God's people. Or uh, us, the the chosen, the elect of God. Uh, We have our election, our sanctification, uh, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, our rebirth to a living hope, our inheritance, which is reserved in heaven for us, uh, our being kept by the power of God through faith for the salvation to come. And we have our great joy, this inexpressible joy joy which is full of glory so we come to the section on hope uh, the hope that we have as Christians now if you remember back to the series on the resurrection we looked at the hope that Jesus resurrection give us Uh, Jesus resurrection is our hope it's our hope of our resurrection to come as well and hope is is looking forward it is for what we, we don't currently have but which we will receive when we too are physically resurrected into our new and glorious bodies in the eternal state. From Peter's letter, we are charged to rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, we are to to strengthen the focus of our hope. That's the primary thrust of this passage. The words, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you. That's, That's the main thrust. So what does that mean? What does it mean to rest your hope fully? Well, it means to set your hope perfectly, unchangeably, without doubt and despondency. Another version of scripture puts it as to fix your hope completely on the grace. Therefore, the Apostle Peter is exhorting us to make our hope one that is complete and strong and not wavering. I think that's what you said, wasn't it, Donna? Not to not, to not, to not waver. Yeah, to have a steadfast hope. So we have a duty to develop and strengthen our hope, just as we need to develop and cultivate other attributes, patience and self-control. So we need to cultivate our hope. For without a hope that is strong, our faith might waver, and we could be subject to fear and doubt, depression. So we need to cultivate and strengthen our hope so we can live joyful and victorious lives as Christians. That's the main point of verse 13, an exhortation to strengthen our hope, to make it stronger. Just as we are to grow in faith and love, so we are also to grow in hope. Now, to do this, we need to identify the focus of our hope. Uh, As defined in verse 13, our hope is the the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
It's the, the unmerited favor that we'll receive when Jesus comes again. If you remember back to the last message I gave, we looked at hope, and hope is many things. Hope is the, the inheritance reserved in heaven for you. Hope is the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Hope is the, the praise and honor and glory we shall receive at the revelation of Jesus. And hope is the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In, in view of all these verses, the, the focus of our hope is to be the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the wonderful grace he will bring. Our hope is to be the wonderful praise and honor and glory we shall receive when he comes. Our hope is the complete and final salvation of our souls from sin and its effects. And our hope is the receiving of our wonderful inheritance, the heavenly city, which is incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away. For now, it's a hope because we don't yet have it fully. But it is our hope, our assurance of what is to come. So that, this is the focus of our hope. And as we said before, that the main thrust of this passage is to rest our hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you. Is that easy? I don't think it's always easy. How do we achieve this? How does that look in our lives? Well, there's a little passage, a little excerpt from what Debbie read that will help us to understand that. I had a different version than you, Debbie. Uh, mine was, with minds that are alert and fully sober. What, was your, what were your words, Debbie? Uh, no, it was, I think it's verse 13. You read something slightly different. So with, with minds that are alert, so that's, that's an active tense, and fully sober. So what the Apostle Peter is saying is we must put aside all of the things that would hinder our growth and maturity in becoming more and more like Christ. We must put out of the mind such things as worry and fear, doubt, obsession with material possessions. I, I call them first world problems. Uh, in the third world, they worry about their next meal. In the first world, I think we worry if our phone's not charged or... Uh, if the car's got a flat battery yeah. first world problems yeah. we need to put all those things aside remove anything and everything that is not conducive to having a strong hope in the coming of our Lord drunkenness uh, worrying about the cares of this life that these things they, they choke us and hinder our ability to bear fruit we need to be sober and the word sober means to be calm and collected in spirit, to have a, a temperate nature. It's that state of mind in which a person is self-controlled and able to see things without the distortion caused by worry and fear. So to strengthen the focus of our hope requires a calm and serious attention to this task. We can't cultivate or strengthen our hope if we're so weak-minded that we allow those things to divert us away from our true calling. And what, what is our calling? Well, we looked at it last time. Our, our calling, as the Apostle Peter describes it, is to, to sojourn through this life. We are strangers in the world. We are pilgrims of the dispersion. We are just journeying through this current existence, but with a hope that is resting fully upon the grace we receive when Christ comes again. I think that the, the problem with many Christians is not that they have no hope, but that their hope is weak and shallow because they're so preoccupied with the daily worries of this life. To remain faithful to the Lord, we need to heed Peter's exhortation to, to strengthen the focus of our hope by freeing our minds of all those things that would hinder us and in being more serious about the kind of lives our Heavenly Father would have us live. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're going to come to that a bit more in this next section, that the fear of the Lord. Again, don't be scared. It is a good and godly, reverent fear of our Creator. 
So we, we've seen that we have the responsibility to strengthen the focus of our hope and set it fully upon the grace that we are to receive when Jesus comes again. And another responsibility we have as Christians is to conduct ourselves as obedient children. Now, I don't want to come across all legalistic about this, but this aspect of Christian life in walking in obedience is strongly reinforced through Scripture. So how does it look in our lives? In what ways are we to be obedient? We're going to focus on three things. We are not to conform to former lusts. Uh, the word conform means to conform oneself to another's pattern. So conform means to just follow the ways of the world. The world goes that way, I'll follow. So that, that's what conform is. The former lusts refer to the evil desires and behavior in which we once engaged and in which the world continues to engage. Essentially, Peter is saying, don't act like you once did or like those who are still in the world. Don't adopt their sinful habits, their mannerisms, their dress, their speech, all the ways which you did before you became a Christian. We will not seek to act like those who are, who are not Christians because you can conform to the world. So the, the world goes that way. I'll just go along with that. But we are, we are transformed, aren't we? So the world goes that way. We take a bit of a sidetrack <laughs> off this other way, <laughs> that the road less traveled. So as transformers, us, we're those who have undergone a true change on the inside and we manifest that difference on the outside. To behave properly as obedient children, then we need to be sure we're not adopt adopting the sinful habits or, or mannerisms of those in the world. So in a dress, speech, actions... I think too many Christians, they, they still do conform to the world and its lusts. Uh, therefore, it's not surprising to hear many becoming entrapped by the world. As Christians, we need to heed what the Apostle Peter is saying. We are to be holy in all our conduct. Holiness is <coughs> sanctification. That's the, the second phase of salvation, uh, gr growing. So there's salvation, growth, and rewards. Or justification, sanctification, glorification. So being set apart, being sanctified, is becoming holy. To be holy means that we are set apart or dedicated for God. We, we are to be holy for at least two reasons. The first reason is what Debbie read to us. For I, God, am holy. The God who has called us through his gospel is a holy God. He himself is set apart from sin and wickedness. And his very nature demands a similar holiness from us. And also, it is also Jesus' desire that we, that we be holy. That's why he died. He died for this very purpose. So we, we are to be holy in all our conduct. Holiness is not something we just put on on a Sunday morning to make ourselves look good. No, in, in our, holiness is in our daily life. Our entire conduct is to be set apart in service to God. So for this to be true, every aspect of our life must be in harmony with God's demand for holiness. Our, our work, our speech, our dress, our leisure, all of this should be in harmony with the principles of God's word. Even the most mundane things, when done in keeping with God's will, becomes a part of our holy service to God. So can we say this about our whole lives? Are we holy in all our conduct? I think I said it before, God doesn't expect sinless perfection, but he expects us to be growing. And that's, that's the sanctification, is the, the growing Uh, do we go about our business and our leisure with the thought of being set apart to the will of God? Is it evident on the outside? Uh, you, you are aware that we have re recently enacted church discipline uh, and there was much pain. Uh, if anyone else says otherwise, <laughs> no, there, there was much pain. We, 
we do not take these things lightly. Uh, if anyone's wondering why we took this step, it was because of unrepentant sin. God's word calls on us to live holy lives and to be holy in all our conduct. None of us should take this lightly, but any of us can come under the Lord's discipline. In the Old Testament, we read in Proverbs, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves. That's in the Old Testament. We see the same thing in the New Testament. In one of the letters to the seven churches in Revelation, the Lord says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Uh, We must conduct ourselves in fear. In view of the judgment of our Heavenly Father, who will not be partial, he will not show favouritism, and he will be personal. He will judge each one according to each one's work. No one will be favoured or receive special favours. Therefore, in view of the high cost of our salvation, we were not redeemed from our sins with silver or gold. We were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who was without blemish and without spot, who was destined to die for our sins before the world began. Jesus Christ, who came to this earth for our sake, and by whom our faith and hope are in God. So from this passage today, we we can learn that proper conduct as obedient children means that we we are not to conform ourselves to former lusts or the ways of the world. We, We are to be holy in all our conduct, and we are to conduct ourselves in fear, in a right and reverent fear of our Lord. The the Apostle Paul said much the same thing when he wrote to the church at Corinth. He said, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We we can't do this on our own. I think in our own strength, we we are nothing, we can do nothing. But by the redeeming grace of God, we can be forgiven by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we can be strengthened by the power of his spirit to live the sort of lives that is pleasing to our Heavenly Father. Do you love Jesus? And have you responded to the call of grace of God in order to receive such wonderful blessings as well? I'll I'll ask everyone as well, uh, after we've sung our final song and after the final prayer, if you'd like any special prayer in your life, I just invite you to come forward and Dave and I can pray with you over that. Whatever it is, uh, just if you want to in your own private way, uh, please make the invitation to anyone to come forward as well after we've had that final song. Thanks, Glenn.